Today I'm going to talk to you about little people, the little people mythology. I've been studying the little people and the paranormal for over 10 years of my life. Ever since I was a child, my mom would tell me stories of the Ishiguks, and throughout the years I've acquired a lot of evidence that showed me that these things are actually real flesh and blood beings and not some, a figment of our imagination or folklore. In this video, I'm going to present a lot of the information I learned and hopefully make you a believer too. The Tokoloshi of Africa. In Africa, they talk about a little, about three foot tall humanoid that people are terrified of. They call them the Tokoloshi. The Tokoloshi are said to be summoned by evil shamans. They're supposed to be lecherous and kidnap children and befriend children. People in South Africa are so scared of the Tokoloshi that they've made movies about the horror of them. And they actually raise their beds off the ground so they can look under their beds to make sure a little person isn't under there first. The interesting thing about the Tokoloshi is their description. It matches Irish folklore and the folklore in Alaska and a lot of Native American tribes of the little people. They're about three foot tall. They show them with a hooked nose, just like other cultures do, pointy ears. The Tokoloshi live underground. They come out at night. Everyone knows about the Irish little people, the leprechauns. Now these things are described in a similar fashion. They have pointy ears, little uh, like pointy noses, large noses. They always describe the noses as different. A lot of them have beards. They live underground. They don't like to come out during the, the daylight. They're mischievous, like they talk about in a lot of cultures. In Indonesia, motorcyclists recorded what, what they perceived to be a little person. Now, as you watch this video, you can see motorcyclists come across a small man and he runs away. You can't really tell how tall he is right now. But in a moment, you'll see him run into the grass. And if you pay attention to the little person's height, he's the grass is taller than him. And the people get out now, and you'll notice that one of the men will stand near the grass, and you can get a height comparison between a normal person and the little person that they saw. <laughs> As you can see, the grass is about up to his waist. Now let's slow this video down and compare, do a height comparison. As you can see that the little person's height is well below the grass, about waist level for the man. And if this man's an average height, I would just roughly guesstimate that the little man was about three foot tall. Now this footage was taken on the northern tip of the island of Sumatra in Indonesia. And when you watch this in slow motion, you can see better how his head is below the grass level where the other guy's waist was. This tiny tooth fragment was the first evidence found of a tiny hominid. It was found in 2004 in an archaeological dig in Indonesia. This sheds light on a tiny hominid known as Homo florensiensis, also known as a hobbit. Back in 2004, in the Liangbu cave on the island of Flores, very small bones were found of an unknown hominid. They had very small skulls. Their brain size was about 400 milliliters as opposed to humans' large 900 milliliter brains. 
The hobbits were estimated to be just over one meter tall, which is about three feet. The hobbits are a new hominid discovered by science. They have been proven through various tests that they are not humans with birth defects, but an actual new hominid. New smaller fossils found in the same region of the hobbits have shown that they're a branch off of Homo erectus and not a branch off of Homo sapiens. So this means, like Neanderthals, the Homo floresiensis are a branch off of the human species that went in a different direction. One interesting finding is that even though they were small and their brains are not much larger than that of a chimp, these hobbits were intelligent and built tools. Brain size, apparently, is not a determining factor when it comes to intelligence and tool building. The brain size of Hobbit floresiensis is, is very small, the size of a chimpanzee, but they made stone tools and they walked upright. The fact that their brain size is not a determining factor for their intelligence and that they made tools leads me to believe that perhaps it's possible that intelligence does not come from brain size, but maybe something like the soul. It was recently discovered that birds have very compact neural density in their brains compared to humans. That's why a bird with a brain the size of a walnut like a raven can be as intelligent as a primate. Is it possible that these little people also possess very compact neural networks, more compact neurons than humans? Is this why they're so intelligent? Or does it have more to do with the soul to brain connection? The people in Indonesia in that region also talked about the Ibu Gogo, which was a small, hairy-like humanoid that would come out at night and would eat anything. The skeletons of these hominids were found. That alone is proof enough think of in the past how many times have we found skeletons of, of children and assumed because it's small as a child and didn't really do any more research how many people who found these skeletons of humans were anthropologists or bone experts and able to say hey this bone's a little different this is not a human i'm positive that we've found countless little people skeletons in the past in hills underground and we've dismissed it as children's skeletons. And that's, this is one of the big reasons why the little people are still a mythological being. <clears throat> the stories of little people are from everywhere. Nearly every country that I've researched has stories of little people. Witches are always described as having large hooked noses, pointy ears, and green skin. Little people are also described as having those features. An interesting fact about humans is that our noses and our ears never stop growing. So what would happen if we lived to be 500 years plus old? What would our noses and ears look like? They'd probably be pretty large. If the little people are related to humans and they're, they're another hominid and we're just branched off species from them or something, then if they grew to be very old, it would make sense why they'd have huge ugly hanging noses and ears like in a lot of descriptions of goblins and stuff which people say. So all the mythology and all the games and Dungeons and Dragons and video games that show these hook nosed goblins, the source of the stories, the source of what they look like actually comes from little people descriptions. In the 1940s, a small boy in North Carolina found a strange coin type object. It's about one inch long and has the face of exactly what you describe a goblin or a leprechaun to look like. In the same area that he found this, uh, the Cherokee talk about the little people that live in the hills there. When they're b doing construction of the college in North Carolina, the tractors would fall into the earth because there's all these tunnel networks everywhere throughout the entire hill, this hill. And the native people said that little people lived there. And during a big flood, a boy found this small little coin, this one inch coin. I don't know if it's a coin, it might be a medallion or a piece of art, but it clearly depicts the head of, of the mythological beings of little people. And, it, and the funny thing about it is, it matches descriptions from Ireland, it matches descriptions from the Native Americans, even the Inupiaq people. The Children of Woolpit is an ancient account dating back to the 12th century, which tells of two children that appeared on the edge of a field in the village of Woolpit in England. The young girl and boy had green-hued skin and spoke an unknown language. The children became sick and the boy died but the girl recovered and over the years came to learn English. She later relayed the story of their origins, saying they came from a place called St. Martin's Land, which existed in an atmosphere of permanent twilight and where the people lived underground. According to the account of the Green Children, 
A boy and his sisters were found by reapers working their fields at harvest time near some ditches that have been excavated to trap wolves at St. Mary's of the Wolf Pits. Wool Pit. Their skin was tinged with a green hue. Their clothes were made from unfamiliar materials, and their speech was unintelligible to the reapers. They were taken into the village, where they were eventually accepted into the home of a local landowner, Sir Richard de Cain Wilkes. The children would not eat any food presented to them, but appeared to be starving. Eventually, the villagers brought round recently harvested beans, which the children devoured. They survived only on, by eating beans for many months until they acquired a taste for bread. The boy became sick and soon succumbed to illness and died, and the girl remained in good health and eventually lost her green-tinged skin. She learned how to speak English and was later married to a man at Kingsland, the neighboring county of Norfolk. After she learned to speak English, she relayed the story of their origins. The girl reported that she and her brother came from the land of St. Martin, where there was no sun but a perpetual twilight, and all the inhabitants were green like them. She described another luminous land that could be seen across a river. She and her brother were looking after their flock when they came upon a cave. They entered the cave and wandered through the darkness for a long time until they came out the other side, entering into bright sunlight, which they found startling. It was then that they were found by the reapers. One of the things I found really interesting about this story was the fact that the children were said to have green skin. This matches a lot of goblin sightings. It matches stories of the witches and goblins and the little people. Many people say they're green skin, the little green men. I'm sure you've heard that before. And another interesting point was that they would only eat beans, meaning beans are the only food they recognize. So what would that mean? Perhaps people who discovered a way to survive underground found that the only plants, or some of the only plants that they can grow are beans, and maybe there are some other ones that we're not aware of, but maybe some kind of strain of bean that is able to grow in low light conditions. The question I have is, if humans can develop green skin from living in this environment, then it would, if these little people lived above ground, they wouldn't have green skin. So it would mean the reason behind the green skin has something to do with the diet they eat or their environment. And I don't know which if either of those would cause a green tinge skin, but the girl's skin turned normal after however long living on the surface, so it means it has to do with the diet or the environment. I think that this helps prove that the little people are green for a reason, and the little green it adds more credence to little green men's stories and the stories of little people. I have a theory on the origin of little people, on what might have happened to create them. A long time ago, we had a disaster, and this is talked about in the Hopi prophecies, in the Hopi, old Hopi stories. We had a disaster that forced mankind to go underground. Now, I don't know if it was the great flood that's talked about in Chinese literature and biblical references, or if it was something else, but something happened that made people have to live underground for generations. What I believed happened was humans went underground and when the coast was clear and we were able to come up again, some groups of people did, liked it down there and they wanted to stay and they made a way of life or something down there. And other, another group came out. The group that came out became us and the group that stayed underground evolved to be different. And uh, that's probably where the little people came from. They might have started shrinking in size for whatever reason, maybe lack of food. Their eyes got bigger to absorb more light and they have a completely different culture. If they were able to survive for tens of thousands of years underground and we're an offshoot of them and they're an, off or they're an offshoot of us, then they may not have suffered the disasters that mankind has suffered and may have been able to retain their technology. Now, is it possible that aliens aren't actually aliens? When I heard of little people having large eyes from a lot of witnesses that I've met, they have large, like owl-like almost eyes. It made me think of greys, but the greys don't, they just don't look like the little people description. They don't look like little elves. But the large eyes and the three foot tall thing uh, matches the depiction of little people. So it made me wonder if the greys were somehow some kind of subterranean race of humanoids too or something else i don't know idea but how do we know that these advanced technology things that we're seeing in the skies like ufos how do we know that they're coming from an alien world and not from underground somewhere where 
where beings were able to make cities down there and they haven't been destroyed in thousands of years so their technology is more advanced than ours why does it have to be aliens why do we gotta jump on the alien boat the arctic small tool tradition now this is really interesting because archaeologists have been finding small artifacts of arrowheads and various inuit tools and Nupiak tools and they assumed humans were just making toys but the native people know that these are artifacts of the little people but of course uh, western western civilization they're gonna listen to native stories and say ah that's folklore like just roll their eyes and not and dismiss it offhand without looking into it seriously i believe that these tools are proof that the little people are real the atacama desert mummy this mummy was found in chile and it matches the description of a type of little people, the one foot tall type. Of course, the scientists jumped to conclusions, this is an alien, this is an alien. Like, how do you know it's an alien? Like, why do you think that? It's a huge conclusion jump and it really makes no sense. Attaboy. Attaboy from Ripley's Believe It or Not bought a little mummy that mysteriously went missing. And it matches the Atacama Desert Mummy. Now, as to the reason why I don't think humans and the little people or any other hominid species are friends, just think of how we treated black people and other races when the white people first interacted. We hated each other, like there's wars, they treat them like subhumans. What would happen if we ran into something that was just like from legend? Like chances are, if you see something you don't know, it's gonna scare you and you're probably gonna be like, oh shit, start shooting at it or something to like, a lot of people are so scared of the unknown that they'll attack it or harm it and freak the hell out. For example, there's a story of a farm in Kentucky where these people were attacked by these strange men with long arms. And they the pe they were walking up to them, walking up the door, and they just started unloading on them. Like, understand it's scary, but imagine if we were aliens and we were like me like are you yourself imagine if you were trying to approach some alien creature and you're like in peace and you're like don't worry i'm not gonna hurt you it's okay i'm not gonna hurt you and then they start freaking throwing no, launching spears at you and shit and you'd be like oh what the hell and you'd run away but like, okay these these people are crazy like i don't want to have anything to do with them i believe one of the big reasons why little people aren't in mainstream media right now is because the majority of people who see these little tiny beings are gonna think like wow this is crazy like I saw something out of Dungeons and Dragons it makes no sense and people are gonna think they're crazy they're gonna roll their eyes at it because not many, and because it's not popular like Bigfoot's popular people aren't gonna have the courage to come out with their stories and their sightings they're gonna feel like um, psychos it's kind of the same thing that happened with Bigfoot's one Bigfoot was just starting to gain momentum in the paranormal field. When people said they saw a tall hairy man, it was generally like scoffed at. But now that there's thousands of sightings and it's like accepted now uh, socially that you've seen Bigfoot and that you believe they're real, now it's okay to see one. But it's not okay to see a dwarf or a little person or a little elf-like being because those are just fantasy. Here's an example of how little people's sightings are not taken seriously. Well, just in time for St. Patrick's Day, crowds are coming by the dozens to get an up-close view at what some say is a piece of Irish folk folklore. Some people in the Crichton area of Mobile say a leprechaun has taken up residence in their neighborhood. A leprechaun. NBC 15's <laughs> Brian Johnson has more. Curiosity leads to large crowds in Mobile's Crichton community, many of you bringing binoculars, camcorders, even camera phones to take pictures. To me, it looked like a leprechaun to me. All I got to do is look up in the tree. Who else in the leprechaun say yeah? yeah! yeah! Eyewitnesses say the leprechaun only comes out at night. Notice how he said they only come out at night, just like all the mythology and settings of the little people. If you shine a light in its direction, it suddenly disappears. This amateur sketch resembles what many of you say the leprechaun looks like. This newscast went viral, which just goes to show if we're actually having sightings and encountering a new form of hominid, how seriously it would be taken. So try to keep an open mind. Don't let um, preconceived judgments blind you. Another common factor that is often depicted with little people that matches the UFO phenomenon is missing time. People will often 
meet with the little people or spend time with them. And it'll seem like an hour has passed for them, but in the outside world, 10 years or more will have passed. I'm reminded of a story that I've heard of a man who was hiking, coming back from hunting, and he had his pregnant wife was at home. He just got married. He's happily married. This is in one of the villages near where I live. He was hiking and he saw a cave and a cliff face or a rock and there are little people and they're like hey come on come with us uh, have some tea he's like all right so i went with them these little three foot tall humanoids and he had some tea and he hung out with them they had like a snacks he ate some whatever food i, I don't know the exact details he had a good time and then he left and when he got back to the village uh, 15 years or more had passed his wife remarried they thought he died his son was a teenager and the guy was pretty devastated because he loved his wife and she was with someone else and it was like she's way older and all this stuff there's other stories similar to that in an Inupiat culture where someone will meet uh they'll be watching a little person he left his gear behind him he goes he sees a little hole a hole in the rock a cave he sees little people talking to each other he goes up to it and watches them and he's like oh man that was interesting and he goes back to his stuff it's all decayed and rotten like it's been there for years. And then he goes back to his village. Everyone thought he was dead because he's been missing for a long time. And you got to think uh, with the missing 411, how many of these cases have to do with missing time? Like how many of them have met something like this where they're just hanging out for like 10 minutes and people, everyone thinks they're dead and search parties can't find them because they're hanging out. And then when they leave, 10 years has passed. Like, I, I don't know if, uh, if there's any modern stories of that, but in Ireland, um, a long time ago, uh, th there's a story of uh, a couple friends. One of them was newly wed, and the other one wasn't. And they're walking home, and the they heard music. They heard music playing, and the one of the guys was like, "Oh, let's go check it out. Let's go dance or whatever. Let's hang out. This is awesome. There's some good music playing. It was strange music." And the guy's like, "Nah, I got to get back to my wife. She'll be pissed," you know. And so the guy's like, eh, all right, man, I'll see you later. Peace. So I'm paraphrasing, obviously. So the dude goes up and goes in the dance or whatever with this group of people dancing in a circle, of little people. And the other guy goes home. And uh, the next day, they can't find the guy, his friend. And uh, there starts to be a, there's an investigation that goes on, and he's accused of murder. And he did not murder his friend, and he's, like, freaking out about it, and his wife wants to prove his innocence. So... The guy goes to prison for murder, and then the, his wife talks to some old man that knows a lot about the fae, or the fairy folk, or whatever, and he says, he wants to know the exact date that he went missing, and she tells him, and then he goes back to the exact same spot one year later, and at the same time that the guy went missing, they hear the music playing again, and they run up and they grab the guy and they tackle him down and like where the hell have you been and he's like what i've just been dancing for a few minutes so stories like that from around the world about time distortion with the uh, fae folk or the little people i'm not sure how true that is or how it's possible but given the fact that um my culture and Upiak people who are we're so obs like we're way out there we're living in the arctic we're not influenced by ireland tells but we have the same stories we have similar similar stories with the similar effects so i can't help but think that because we believe or we know about the people little people in time distortions and other cultures talk about the exact same thing that are on the other side of the world that that must be true how would we have the same stories it makes no sense if any of you guys have any information on these things go ahead and message me uh, email me xenohuntersinfo at gmail.com or write a comment you can get in contact with me on facebook too i'm kit to be talk and i have a xeno hunters page compared to like sasquatch sightings uh, little people is not very well known and there is really not that much on the internet about them but i think if it became mainstream that would completely reverse and we'd hear thousands of accounts and sightings that'd be popping up all over the place everyone would be like oh i saw that too blah 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 instead of keeping it secret like they do now. I actually did a TV show called Escaping Alaska. And when I was on that show, I was trying to get funding for an expedition so I could prove that these little people are real. And the majority of the responses, I got some positive responses, but 
the majority of the responses I got for saying, yeah, these little green men are these little, these little people like leprechauns. Uh, we have mythology about them. A lot of sightings of them here in Alaska. And most people are like, they're not real. <laughs> like hysterically laughing at how stupid it was that I was trying to prove something that is unknown. There's a reason for, um, for trying to prove something. It's because it's not known. So we don't know much about these things, but I think that could be changed because I know some of the native communities in Alaska, we used to trade with the little people and visit with them and talk with them and stuff. Uh, and I know there's a village in Alaska where they still visit. So I'd like to check that place out now. It's just a matter of funding and getting together the resources to properly document and prove that these things are real. But yeah, like and subscribe if you like this video. As I said, it's going to help get the word out. I want to get the ball rolling on my research and hopefully more people will start sharing their stories.